remember what the inner critic is doing. It knows there is a clear and present danger from past experience and it wants to protect you. So it stands between you and that goal. It's in the middle and it says, no, 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 this is danger. Now, what everyone, this is because this is how we've been culturally conditioned. What we're trying to do is we're going to argue with the inner critic. We're going to beat our way through it. That thing, it's going to beat you at chess like 10 times out of 10. Like you're not winning against your inner critic. But what we could do um, is to go around the inner critic, go to that dangerous thing, to that goal, to that ambition, and try it out. And what happens? Either you succeed or you learn or you realize, you know what? I actually failed, but it's not half as bad as I thought it would be. And your inner critic gets a tiny little bit smaller because it's energy efficient. If there's not a, not a big danger, I don't have to speak up that loudly. So you do that again and again and again. You go where the you go where the fear lies. You know, you go where the danger is, and you show your inner critic, hey, you know, actually, uh, this is not as bad as you thought. And the inner critic will pre start preserving energy. And be like, okay, then I don't have to speak up. I can take a nap. This is when you know the the inner critic kind of sh starts shutting up and goes and has a drink. And a way in which we do that in Unstoppable, for example, where the participants often struggle with social anxiety, with the fear of getting rejected, embarrassing themselves when they talk to strangers, I have them go out into a public place and have them do a little bit silly exercises. Like they might go out there and lie down on the sidewalk or lie down in a mall. And their inner critic in week one is on fire. Like it's doing a handstand on the mental catastrophe curve. And they're like, I could never do that. And then they tell me how they've been walking around that mall for like three hours. And then they realize this is not getting better. I have to like do this. And the next week they come back to our Q&A session and they share with, with, with me and with the others and say, the first time, this was so scary. It took me like an hour or two before I, I dared do it. But the fifth time I did it, I didn't even shrug anymore. Like I didn't even break a sweat. It was so easy. What's the next challenge? Because this one isn't triggering my buttons anymore. And, and that, is, that is the way to deal with the inner critic. You go around it. You show it, hey, this dangerous thing, this dream that I have, it's not scary at all. Let me show you. That's why we're calling this quieting the inner critic. Because in our experience, the more you listen to the inner critic and give up, submit, roll over, the louder it gets it becomes more confident. It feels more comfortable expressing itself in various areas of your life. Oh, I kept you safe from public speaking. Now I'm going to keep you safe from saying anything out of turn in your first date. Oh, I kept you safe from your first date. Now we're not going to go to that social event. We're going to put on Netflix. So your inner critic starts to make itself really comfortable in your life and guide a lot of your decisions and actions in ways that keep you away from those goals and ambitions. But the more you actually go around the inner critic, the quieter that inner critic becomes in other areas of your life. So even if you're not feeling socially anxious, but you're stepping outside of your comfort zone in a moment where that inner critic's gonna say, hey, that's unsafe, people are gonna look at you, you're gonna find that in other areas then, when that inner critic might feel like speaking up, it's just gonna be a little bit quieter. It's turning the volume down on that inner critic in other areas of your life. Mm -hmm.